So we continue this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is uh, a, a look at the central truth of the gospel, the resurrection. Uh, and, and as we kind of get into, and, and we've got another couple weeks that will be in this chapter, um, don't lose sight of something that, that, that Paul loved this church deeply. And, and he knew that they needed correction, that they needed direction, but, but even bigger than that, even sort of zoomed out a little bit more from that, he wanted to encourage them. And they needed encouragement. We all need that. That's the kind of the constant need of, of believers and encouragement. And he even began in the very opening, he began with encouraging them, even before he started with the correction. He reminded them at the beginning that they're the church of God. They're a true church. They're a, they're a church that actually does gather to worship the one true God. He, he reminded them that they've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. And, of course, sanctification is this already but not yet thing, that we are sanctified in Christ. You have been made holy. When God looks at you as a believer, He sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see the pride and, and selfishness and sin that, that, that we sometimes feel is so prevalent in our lives. He treats us as if we never committed one sin, even though you've probably committed far too many to count. I know I have. And sanctification is also a process. It's a both already and not yet. It's something that you pursue your entire life. You're not there. You still have places to go. You still have growth that needs to happen. And, and actually, the more you grow, the more unsatisfied you will be with where you are, which is a good thing. Remember, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus because it's God who is at work in you to, for his good pleasure. So be encouraged because you are holy and you have been made holy. And, and he's holding on to you. All of that comes before any correction. He also reminds them that they're called to, called to be saints. You didn't start the work and you don't have to complete it, although you do have to make effort toward it. He chose you in spite of you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. Paul goes on to remind them he's abundantly thankful for them. It's for the, and then he, 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 he closes with the grace and peace that God has poured out on them. He even reminds them that spending time in the Word leads to being enriched in Him. And the truth of the gospel, the witness was confirmed in them. And even as they eagerly await for His return, which is kind of where we're going with the passage today. That was Paul's opening encouragement, which they would need to endure the 14 chapters of, of correction. And then we sort of come full circle when we get here to chapter 15. We're still talking about the resurrection. We're going to begin in verse 12 today. Uh, but now we're turning our thoughts from to both the resurrection and when we will be resurrected. Because those are connected, right? We're headed toward that last trumpet, when the dead will be raised incorruptible. When death is swallowed up in victory and when we have ultimate victory at his return. And I tell you what, I can't wait for that. Like this whole chapter is just encouraging, right? Last week when we opened, the first 11 verses, we saw that the church had, had received this, this message, the message of the gospel. They had believed it. Paul's main message, the, the message that they had heard, that they had believed, the message that saved them, the message that they were holding fast to was the gospel. This is what changed them. And, and the central elements of that are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Those, that's the core of the gospel. That's the message that we need to hear again and again and again. That's what we've gathered this morning to celebrate. I mean, it's literally the reason we're here is to celebrate the resurrection. Because Christ died for our sins. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. That's so encouraging. For, for those of us who he, here who are saved, Jesus died on the cross for us. And he rose again on the third day. He fulfilled prophecy. He proved that everything he said was true. And the power that brought him back from the dead dwells, lives inside each one of us. That's such an encouraging thing. He went on after his resurrection to appear to many people. More than 500 at one time, he even appeared to Paul, who was on a trip to go murder Christians, to persecute them. Verse 11 then kind of pulls it all together from that opening. So we preach and so you believed, and I love the amazing simplicity of that phrase. So we preached, and so you believed. So we preach, and people believe. That's kind of how it works. That's the simple plan of God, preaching and believing. 
you know, if faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ, that's, that's what's going on here. And that's not a promise that every time you share the gospel with someone, someone's going to believe. But that is a reminder that God's plan for us is to preach his gospel and he has chosen to use us in that process. That's amazing. And, and, and if you're at all like me, uh, evangelism can sometimes feel like sort of a daunting task, a little bit scary. It can be a little nervous going into it. It's like one of those things that, okay, I know I should do this. I know I should say this. I know there's a benefit to it. I know that it's a command. I know that there's joy on the other side, but there's still fear and trepidation kind of as you go into it. So because of that, we have to constantly remind ourselves, constantly reform our thinking. Yes, preaching the gospel, which is something we're all called to do, preaching the gospel is a command. Yes, preaching the gospel is an obligation. And you've heard me say this before, but you'll hear me say it again. It's also a privilege. We need to remember that. It's not that we have to share the gospel. It's that we get to share the gospel. Don't ever forget that. So we preach. And so you believed. That's how God has planned and that's how God has set it up. And so this morning, as we look, continue looking at the resurrection and the centrality of it, what we're going to see this morning is why the resurrection is so central and so important. Uh, so if you haven't opened your Bibles, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're starting this morning in verse 12. And we're going to really look at the consequences and the reality of the, re- of the resurrection this morning so that we can be encouraged by the truth of what it is and what it means in our daily lives. So I invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll begin this morning in, in verse 12 and go through verse 23. This is the Word of the Lord. Now, if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we bore witness against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, after that, those who are, who are Christ's at his coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as always for your word and just for the, the encouragement this is. Thank you for, for what this passage tells us about the importance of the resurrection and, and the, the consequences both of no resurrection, but also the consequences of the reality of the resurrection, the joys and the things that we can lean into. So help us to understand what you're saying to us through your word this morning and let it bring joy to our hearts that we can take with us into our daily lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So we begin really <clears throat> this morning with, with the, the big question. In verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, and that's of course the central preaching of the gospel, it includes the resurrection of the dead, he goes on to say, How do some of you, some among you say there is no resurrection? Remember, Paul is writing in response to uh, just some issues going on in this church. And, and they had written him a letter and, and asked him some questions, but he had also very likely heard some things about what was going on. So we don't know if this particular issue here um, has, because if they wrote and said, hey, Paul, can you please help us out here? Because there are some people here who say uh, that, that there's no resurrection of the dead. So can you give us some instruction here? Or maybe he had just heard. You know, along the way, uh, would you believe that that church, some of those people don't even believe in the resurrection? So he knows some people there apparently are denying it. So he's addressing a very important topic because keep in mind, and this this is kind of where this whole passage is going, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we know that we will be raised from the dead. Jesus' resurrection and our future resurrection are connected. 
They're directly connected to one another. So what happens to us in the next life? What happens to us after this life, after death? It's an important thing. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of ideas out there as to what happens after you die. A bunch of different things. There's, just one, there's one theory called soul sleep, um, which essentially, if you really look at the kind of the full explanation of that, it's that after death, there's this sort of divide between the body and the soul. The body dies and the soul goes to sleep, which is kind of weird and certainly not what this passage is teaching. There's the materialist view, which is essentially um, annihilationism, saying that after this life, when you die, it's just over. There is nothing else. It's just, that's it. It's kind of the atheistic view. Uh, there's, of course, reincarnation. And there's a whole variety of things about reincarnation that your spirit somehow gets recycled, maybe into an animal, maybe into another human. I, some would say maybe a plant or, I mean, I don't know, you could be a tree, according to that. Um, you come on. And then there's, you know, some people say you're kind of working your way up and what you do in this life depends on what happens in the next life. It's a weird thing. There's this other view called absorption uh, that says when you die, you just sort of... Re your, your spirit just kind of goes back into the, the hive mind, just the kind of the grand spirit of the universe or whatever that is. And, and really, in almost all of those, what's really happening is you're, you're losing any, any individual personhood and, and really you're losing any hope of really anything beyond this life, truthfully. And, and, and for those in Corinth, what likely many of them leaned into was another philosophy, and it was sort of a Greek, the way a lot of the Greeks thought was this, this concept called dualism, it was taught by Plato, and it was basically this. Everything in the physical world is evil and sinful. That's where the evil, bad stuff comes from. And the spirit side of things, that's where the good stuff is. So your, your flesh, the, the physical being, is, is the bad part. Your spirit is the good part. And, and they would want to separate those. And in their mindset, why, if, if, my, if my physical is the bad, why would I want to take that with me into the next life? I want to leave the bad stuff behind. So, so that is possibly what's going on with some of them. Why would I want to take the, the sins and, and the struggles and the issues that I have here into the next life? And, but, of course, that was pagan teaching coming in. And remember, that was one of the problems that the Corinthians had was all of their pagan background and the pagan world that they lived in. Some of that stuff was seeping into the church into various ways. There was even a long-standing divide in Judaism about with the Sadducees, you know, the, in, the, in the leadership, they said there's no resurrection. The Pharisees said there is a resurrection. However, when we start thinking about that, the Old Testament clearly teaches the concept of resurrection. In Job 19, it's affirmed. Psalm 17, uh, the, the psalmist writes, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake, meaning awake from death. Of course, Ezekiel 37 that, that Chris read earlier paints the picture of a physical resurrection. Daniel 12, it can't really get much clearer. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but to the others to reproach and everlasting contempt. And then, of course, what was kind of sometimes, at times cloudy in the Old Testament becomes clear in the New Testament. John 6, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We're familiar with that. But then he goes on to say, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus, that's talking about the resurrection. In John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He be who believes in me will live even if he dies. That's talking about the resurrection. So, and then even when we get into the teaching of the, the apostles, the apostles, the, the resurrection was central to what they taught. Remember, we have, from the absolute beginning of the church, Acts chapter 2, the, the first sermon they were, you know, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, which included Peter saying, you nailed Jesus to the cross and put him to death, but God raised him up from the dead. David spoke of the resurrection. Jesus raised, uh, this Jesus God raised up again. Chapter 3 speaks of the author of life, speaks of Jesus whom God raised from the dead when God raised up his servant. Chapter 4, it talks about their teaching. They were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So even other places outside of, outside of that, the re resurrection is spoken of. So I think that when, when Paul comes, comes to this point, I think he's probably maybe a little surprised, maybe a little irritated. It's hard to say, but he certainly wants to address this. Like, no, the resurrection is important. 
So I don't understand how some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead. Do you not realize that if there is no resurrection of the dead, there are consequences to that? And he goes on to give us seven consequences. And of course, three of them are, uh, the first four are theological and the second three are very personal in what it really means to you. He first says, if there is no such thing as the resurrection, which some of them were saying for some reason, Christ is not risen. And that really is obvious, right? That's kind of the, the, that's almost the most obvious thing in the world. If there is no resurrection, Jesus is still in the grave. And if that's the case, there's no difference between Christianity and every other religion out there, right? Because that's one of the main distinctions between Christianity and other religions. Uh, for, for, for the Muslim, for Islam, you can go to Muhammad's grave. For, for, if, you, if you follow Buddhism, you can go to Confucius' grave. All these other religions, you can go to the, the, the graves of their leaders, but Jesus, you cannot go to his grave. You can go to the place they think he might have been buried, but it's where he was, if they're right about where he was. You cannot go to Jesus' grave because he's not in the grave. And so I think some were probably in this dualistic mindset saying this whole idea of resurrection, is, it's hard to wrap my mind around. So, so maybe we'll take the Greek philosophy and we'll try to work it together. Maybe Jesus didn't really die. Maybe his body died and his, his spirit went on. And Of course, that's ridiculous. That's, Acts rejects that over and over and over. In Revelation 1, Jesus said to John, I'm the living one and I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And so I think one of the things here, just in this verse, this first verse, Paul is this is admonition to them, saying, "Don't allow your pagan thinking to to influence you," because some of them are clearly on that path. And so I think what that says to us today is that we have to be very careful continually to not let secular thinking influence how we understand things. It can't influence or infect our beliefs, and, and that's not just the resurrection. That's every doctrine. That's any doctrine in the Bible. The enemy wants to confuse you about everything. He wants it to seem, well, you can't really know, you can't really understand this, that, and the other. He wants to distort and twist and, and sometimes even just tweak just enough because, you know, the best lie is mostly true. There are a host of things today where not only has the enemy clouded the thinking of far too many believers, but he's even turned some of those things on their head. Critical race theory is, is one of those, this whole woke thing. Um, if you ever hear that people talking about theistic evolution, all of those things are, are on the, the, where, where the enemy has clouded and confused so much thinking in so many Christians. There's a whole thing now um, going on where a lot of people are trying to say that sinful desires are not sinful as long as you don't act on them. I'm sorry, sinful desires are sinful. That's why they're called sinful desires, <laughs> kind of built in. Uh, but there are so many that are, that are twisting and distorting, really ultimately in an effort to justify their own sin and to assuage their guilt. So what you really have to be committed to is you have to be committed to sound doctrine, hearing sound doctrine and not listening to false doctrine, not listening to, to false teachers. And if you ever have a question, is this person a good teacher or a bad teacher? Ask me, ask one of the elders, I'll be happy to tell you. Because it is important that you do listen to good things and do read good books, but it's also important what you don't listen to and what you don't fill your mind with. So that's kind of built into just that first thing. If Christ has not been raised... Then, then, you know, if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. That, that's, that's pagan thinking that's infiltrated. So that's the first one. The second uh, consequence of, of no resurrection is pointless preaching, right? Because the heart of preaching is the gospel. And in fact, if you're not preaching the gospel, you're not preaching. I love the Spurgeon quote. Um, if there's no Christ in your sermon, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. We preach Christ. Him crucified, buried, and risen again. The heart of the gospel is the resurrection. And in fact, if there is no resurrection, then the sermon would be, Jesus died and he was buried. I guess we just go eat lunch, right? It, it's because it's of that. No hope, no joy, no point. It's the resurrection that brings the story alive. It's the resurrection that makes the gospel good news. Otherwise, Jesus died this bloody death, maybe on your behalf, died and is buried in a tomb somewhere over in Jerusalem. It's not a message of hope. 
And of course, it, keep, it gets worse when we get to the third consequence is that your faith has no foundation. It's foundationless faith. Your faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, your faith is empty. It's fruitless. It has no purpose. There is no substance. It's a no thing. It's nothing. You're standing on no foundation, looking at nothing in a vacuum of spiritual emptiness. It's that bad. And then on top of that, this is the fourth implication of that, is that we're all liars and lunatics. We're witnesses, we're false witnesses at best, crazy people at worst. That's really the logical conclusion. If there is no resurrection, if Jesus didn't come back from the grave, then every single person in the Bible, these 500 people, they were all liars. All 12 apostles, liars. James, the brother of Jesus, Paul, liars. Every preacher for the past 2,000 years, liars. Every Christian, you know, on, on Easter Sunday, and, and we probably should do this more than just on Easter Sunday, but you've probably been to a church where on Easter Sunday somebody steps up and says, He is risen, and everybody replies, He is risen indeed. Okay, every time you did that, every time anybody has done that in any church for the past 2,000 years, that was a lie if Jesus has not been risen from the dead. And, and right up to every single one of us here today, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, if there is no resurrection... We are all, every one of us in here, liars. It's, it's, it's crazy, right? Because people who lie constantly about the same thing, even if we all get together to lie about the same thing at the same time, well, that makes us really crazy. So if you're trying to maintain some semblance of, well, the resurrection didn't happen, but I'm trying to hold everything else together. That, again, that's, that's even crazier. All the martyrs throughout the years, all those that were mocked and beaten and tortured and, and put in prison and burned at the stake and drawn in quarters for the sake of Christ, they were all crazy liars because without the resurrection, none of it's true. Even Jesus was a liar if the resurrection isn't true because in Mark 9, he said that he'll be delivered into the hands of men they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise again three days later. So yes, Jesus foretold of his own resurrection. So the theological implications of no resurrection are extreme. But then it gets personal. The fifth thing where they start to turn personal is you're still in your sin, which means if there's no resurrection, you're not going to heaven. You're still in your sin. You're in the same boat as the worst pagan heretic false teacher. You haven't received forgiveness. You haven't been regenerated. Your heart is still dead as a rock. You cannot sing, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever, because there's no victory. You stand where Romans 6.23 leaves you. The wages of sin is death. You're not righteous. You don't understand. You've turned aside. Your throat is an open tomb. Your feet are quick to shed blood. There's ruin and misery in your path. There's no peace with God. You're dead in your sins. If Jesus isn't alive, we aren't either. And then it gets worse, as if it could. Dead believers are gone forever because you won't see any of your loved ones that have gone on because they're just gone. All the Old Testament saints, they're just gone. All the martyrs, dead, buried, that's it. Every single relative you have who is a Christian or loved one who is a Christian and died, if there is no resurrection, it means that when you went to the funeral and the pastor said, you'll see them again, that was a lie. That's not going to happen. Every single funeral I've preached, I've lied to the family in saying that. It's that extreme. And then it keeps going. The last one is that we, as Christians, are the most pathetic people ever. I mean, it actually says that, right? Verse 19, look at verse 19. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, meaning no resurrection afterward... We are of all men most to be pitied. Because this is where it ends. If there's no resurrection, resurrection, death is simply the end of everything. And that means all the hope that we've had in this life, it comes to a screeching halt when we die. And that means we are the most supremely pathetic people in the universe. Everything we've done for Jesus, it's nothing. Every penny you've given to this church or any other church, waste of your money. Every minute you've spent reading your Bible, waste of time, complete waste of time. 
Every minute you've spent in any church doing any kind of religious thing has been absolutely pointless, which means for me, the past 30 years of my life has been a waste, complete waste. My dad just turned 82. He got saved when he was 17 and went to a Christian college right after that. And so that means if there's no resurrection, my dad has wasted the last 65 years of his life. My grandpa left cotton farming to be a preacher. All of that was a waste. He later on went to Africa to be a missionary. All of that was a waste. John MacArthur, who we all know, has been preaching at one church for 60 years. All of that wasted 60 years. Thousands of sermon tapes sent out all over the world from thousands of preachers. Downloads, all these sermons, everything else. Big, giant zilch. The time we're spending right here, right now, this morning, if there's no resurrection... You better hope there's a donut left or some coffee left because that's the only benefit you're going to have from being here if you grab it on your way out quick. It's that severe. The resurrection is that important. You cannot possibly overstate the importance of the resurrection because without the resurrection, there is no gospel at all. Thankfully, verse 19 moves next into verse 20, though, and that's where it all turns around and comes back together. Because it's all just unraveling and falling apart. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead. Okay, good, because I was starting to get worried. All the consequences, all those seven consequences, actually end up in that phrase, now Christ has been raised, they're all turned around. And this is where it really gets encouraging. This is where each one of those seven things becomes great joy. They're all flipped back upside down. Whereas it says, if if Christ is not risen, well, you know what? Christ has been raised. So we can speak of the death, burial, and resurrection of sins. We can say Christ died for our sins. Pointless preaching becomes purposeful preaching. What greater purpose is there than to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? The message is inherently compelling. That's why Paul said back in chapter 9, Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. He's saying I can't not preach the gospel. There is no greater purpose than to preach Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Colossians 1, which has this this beautiful just explanation of who Christ is, speaks of him as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's the resurrection. He is the most important one ever to come back from the grave. He is the preeminent one. All things have been recreated through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. We have to pause. And Does Jesus really have first place in your life? What's the evidence? If you answer yes, then what would you point to that proves he has first place in your life? Because he's the firstborn from the dead. How can he not have first place in your life? For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And Paul was made a minister according to the stewardship of God given so that he can fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And the foundation of that preaching is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Purposeful preaching is making known the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim. That's what we proclaim. Jesus risen from the dead. Acts 17 says, In the past, God overlooks times of ignorance, but God is now commanding men that everyone everywhere should repent, because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He determined, having furnished proof to all by raising Him from the dead. And it goes on to say, when they heard about the dead, some began to sneer. So, yeah, some people are going to respond that way. But others said, we'll hear you again concerning this. See, that's your message too. Jesus Christ died, buried, and raised again. That's your proclamation. That's the message that should always be ready on your lips. It's not just something that your pastor does on Sunday morning in church, standing on the stage with a microphone. Preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, man, that's what we all do. We're all preaching the gospel. We're all called to preach the gospel whenever we can. And so because Jesus has been raised from the dead, it gives us a purpose. The purpose is to preach the gospel. The foundationless faith, the third one, becomes the ultimate foundation. Your faith is not in vain where it was empty and fruitless without purpose or without substance because Jesus has been raised 
you're, it becomes full and overflowing. It produces much fruit. And there's something that's just really cool that, that those of us that are in community with one another, we have the great joy of watching one another growing. We have the great joy of seeing how God is working in and through those as we grow and knowing one another better and better. We'll see God at work in each other's lives and what God is doing through that. Because when we build our lives on the foundation of Jesus, it's not in vain. It is literally the most secure, solid foundation you could build on. And because it's built around the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, we're not liars. We're not lunatics. We are those who have the ultimate message of truth in the entire universe. There is no truer truth than to proclaim the one who is the truth. It's not just the truth. It's not just a truth, but it's the truth. You can fully build your life around the truth of Jesus Christ. Born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary wrath-absorbing death on the cross, was buried, and rose again three days later. And he did that for you. And when you repent of your sins, trust in him, and build your life around that truth, it changes everything. Your life as a believer will not look like what it looked like before. Because you'll have purpose, you'll have joy even in the midst of your trials, and you'll have hope. And these are the theological realities, right? Those are the theological truths and the implications from the resurrection. But then when we start talking about the personal implications, it gets even better. If Christ hasn't been raised, you're still in your sin. But because Christ has been raised, you're not guilty of your sin. I don't know how it can really get better than that, right? Because the biggest problem any human faces is their sin and the guilt that comes along with it. That, that is the, the source of of all problems that everybody has anywhere at any time is the weight of the guilt of the sin that we have. And outside of Christ, there's no hope because you're without God and you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. But because of the resurrection, because Jesus died and rose again, we have forgiveness of our sins because God has declared us not guilty. The gospel message is such good news. It doesn't mean that all your problems are going to be solved, but it does mean you are no longer in your sin. It doesn't mean you won't sin. It doesn't mean you'll escape from all the consequences of your sin. But it does mean that God no longer sees you as guilty when he looks at you. Because you've been given the very righteousness of Christ. Psalm 32 says this, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whose iniquity Yahweh will not take into account. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not cover up. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You're not in your sins anymore. And, and, and that is awesome. And rather than the dead believers just not, you know, falling asleep and have perished, you will see them again, right? It is great comfort in the loss of a loved one, knowing that we will see them again. Those that have fallen asleep, which is just a basic description of, of someone who's passed away, we will see them again. First Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive together and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So there's this, there's this we togetherness that we're going to have. And, and, you know, some of our relationships will be different. You know, marriage in heaven does not look like it looks here, but we'll be there together. And what a joyful reunion that will be. Now we have to be careful in, in understanding this and how we think we can't take it too far. I've heard, I've heard it said at, at funerals I've gone to, and it, it, it makes me cringe when they say, well, heaven needed another angel. Like, okay, I'm sure your grandma was great and wonderful and super sweet, but heaven didn't need her. God didn't bring her because heaven is going to be better with her there. So, you know, and, and you're not going to heaven just to see your, 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 your passed on loved ones. I mean, I've heard people that just talk for hours about, like all they ever talk about is they'll get to see their, 
their, their, their, their spouse that died or their, their grandma or their uncle or whoever. And it's like, it's going to be joyous, but you're there to see Jesus. I'm glad you're here with me. Now let's look at Jesus. It's good, yeah, but it's about, um, what, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I know you're here, but I'm here. I, I'm focused on Jesus. That's what it's going to be. So we have to be careful, but we're going to be there together, right? What this means is that we have the hope and confidence that, that they're not with us. They're with the Lord. They're not just gone. It's not just we'll never see them again. And when we're with Jesus, I'm glad they'll be there 100%, but I'm glad we'll be worshiping Jesus. We'll be looking at him face to face. What a glorious day that will be. And, and then the opposite, right? Because if there is no resurrection, then we are the most pathetic people ever. But there is a resurrection and so we are, every one of us in this room, at this very moment, the most fortunate, blessed people in the universe. Do you realize that? Because if you don't know him, please be reconciled to God. Why would you wait? Because if you don't trust in Christ, all of those consequences, they will be your story. Without Christ, you have no hope, and you are without him, and you're storing up wrath for yourself. And the call is to turn from your sin and to reject your selfish ways because you're at enmity with God. Repent and realize that what you've done is terrible and it's sinful and you deserve God's wrath. And when you turn from sin and self and turn to Jesus and believe who He is and trust in Him and what He did on the cross and His death and burial and resurrection, there's a consequence. And the consequence is that you now know Him. And there's joy in that. And so don't delay that. And then that moves us directly into these next verses. Because not only are we not the most to be pitied, but we're the most joy-filled people because we have more blessing and benefit than anyone, even in our difficulties. Verse 20 brings us to the reality and the plan that Christ has. And this is where we see Christ's resurrection connected to our resurrection. It says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's what verse 20 says. And this is such a rich verse, right? Of course, we've talked about Christ has been raised. And that, that reverses all those negative consequences in verses 13 through 19 because Christ has been raised. And, and here's an interesting thing. It seems like, or it feels like, uh, and maybe this is just me and, and my, my weird way of thinking, but does it not sometimes feel like the only time we really celebrate the incarnation is in the month of December? And then we never really get into the resurrection until uh, one Sunday in March or April, whenever that is. But really every Sunday is a celebration of the, of the resurrection. And, and you know, so that whole he is risen, he is risen indeed. I'm not saying we need to do that every Sunday. Maybe we should do it more than just once a year, though, right? Because that's why we're here. That's why we're here today. It's to celebrate the resurrection. We're, we're not waiting until, I don't even know what the date is. We're not waiting until, you know, Resurrection Sunday for that. It's not just one day a year. And, and this, oh, this passage is so good. And all of this emphasizes the, the importance of the gospel and the reality of the, the centrality of the resurrection in that first fruits. And just that phrase is so cool. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits is what, what precedes the harvest. And, and, you know, they were a very agriculturally based you know, community, so they understand first fruits. It's sort of a, a first payment of, the, of some installment payments. Again, there's more to come. When you see first fruits being given, that means there's more coming. That's the first part of the harvest. There's more. And the more is that Jesus' resurrection and ours are linked together. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be too. It's remarkably encouraging when you see that and really understand that. That's why it's so super emphasized in this passage. Jesus was the first one to be raised to eternal life. And his resurrection here was to live eternally because he conquered death. No more death. He was every, there, was other, there were other people in the Bible who were raised from the dead, but they all died. The most famous is probably Lazarus, right? In, the de in, you know, in there for four days, Jesus... You know, why didn't you come sooner? If you had come, my brother wouldn't have died. He's, you know, everybody knows the story of Lazarus. But you know what? Lazarus is dead. <laughs> he died. I don't know, a few years later. Of course, the, the plot, they, they were wanting to kill him right away. But, but, but Lazarus is, is died. So even his resurrection, he, he died. Again. But this is a whole different resurrection that we're talking about. 
right? When Jesus was raised, it was forever. And our future resurrection, which is what this is pointing to, will be eternal, will be forever. That's that whole by a man. There's this beautiful theological truth. Jesus was the God-man. And because he, as the God-man, was raised physically, we're going to be raised too. And that's an encouragement for our resurrection. Adam was our representative. Adam sinned, we sinned. So we're born in sin and we're going to die because of Adam. But Jesus was raised so that those who are, as the verse says here, in Christ, meaning all who trust in him, all of his descendants, all of his children, all of those who believe in him, will be raised with him at his coming. Every human is born in Adam. We're all Adam's offspring. And believers are in Christ, his descendants, his sons and daughters, co-heirs with him. That, that, that's such a good thing to know, to understand that physical resurrection, our physical resurrection is connected to his physical resurrection. And then there's this kind of final encouragement that tells us what's coming. This is the plan. Verse 23, but each in his own order. Okay, so there's an order, there's a plan, there's a purpose. Christ, the first fruits, and after, those who, after, after that, those who are Christ's, At his coming. That's the plan. Jesus rose from the dead first. He is the most important one. I love the word in Colossians 1, the prototokos, meaning the the preeminent one. But he is the first one to be raised to eternal life. right? The one through whom all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. He's the one that will come to have first place in everything. Jesus was raised first. And when he comes back, we'll be raised too. And that's, that's not just a bland casual passing statement we will be raised with him I mean, that should have every single one of us shouting amen there's not a timeline but but it's a sequence jesus first and then us this is really possibly the most beautiful promise you can imagine i mean think about the the most the most over-the-top promise you've ever, We all make promises to people all the time that we haven't kept. We've had promises made to us that, that haven't been kept. But this promise is a gospel promise. As sure as the virgin birth, as sure as the sinless life, as sure as Jesus died on the cross and buried and rose again, you will be raised too. A new life with a, with a new body. And you can live now, today, in, in the joy of knowing that. Right? That's our hope in life. And death, and, and we of all people have hope, and we can live in great joy no matter the circumstances of our life. That's what allowed Paul to say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He wasn't saying, oh, I can do anything. I, I can hit the ball out of the park. I can, I can have the, the most successful business ever. I, I can make top grades on all of my tests. No, he was saying because of the certainty of the resurrection, I can endure any situation because I will be raised with Christ. You can do that too because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Paul can do all things with great joy because of Jesus Christ whose resurrection power strengthened him and we are strengthened with the same strength in our day-to-day lives. That is what we need to take with us from this passage into our everyday lives is that his strength is our strength. His resurrection is is our resurrection. So we can live in that with joy and with hope and with confidence. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this this beautiful truth, the resurrection, something we really only turn our thoughts to uh, on far too few occasions. But Lord, let this be a, 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 a bigger part of our thinking. Let it be part of our daily experience of of knowing you as remembering that you you died, you were buried, and you rose again. And because you rose again, we not only have that power for living, but we will be raised again when you come back. What a beautiful truth that that gives us the encouragement and and what we need to, to, to make it through the difficulties of our daily lives. The difficulties seem like nothing in light of what's going to happen for eternity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.